Good morning or afternoon or wherever you're uh, piping in from uh, and welcome. We were regaled with uh, questions 67 and 68 from Chicago, although the, at the time they were called Chicago Transit Authority. Uh, Andy so inspired me the last two times with his musical choices that were all number related. Uh, I decided to see if I could find something that was number related. I don't think anything will give me quite as much joy as discovering pinball number count um, when I'm in my 60s. So thank you for that. Uh, I am Steve Wexler. I am the founder and principal of Data Revelations. I am one of the three authors of The Big Book of Dashboards and the author of a book that's coming out in mid-May called The Big Picture. And I'd like to you to meet my uh, co-host on Chart Chat. Uh, let's start with Jeff. Hello, everybody. Jeff Schaefer here. I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of IT and Analytics at Unifund, a company in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I'm also the adjunct professor at uh, the University of Cincinnati, where I teach data visualization. Andy? All right. Hi, everybody. Andy Cotgreave, Technical Evangelist at Tableau and co-author of The Big Book of Dashboards. Great to see you all. Amanda, over to you. Hi there, I'm Amanda McCulloch. I am the data visualization lead at Excella based here in Washington, DC, and also volunteer as the, as the executive director now for the Data Visualization Society. Excited to Great. see everybody. And delighted, um, um, looking for, really looking forward to today's <laughs> chart chat. Um, uh, so let me uh, take us into what we're going to be covering. So it is more than just chit chat. It's certainly not church chat. It is chart chat. And um, I think a lot of people know I show this slide or a variation of it. I'm not going to say the word variant of it uh, at the beginning of every uh, workshop that I give in a lot of presentations. And you are encouraged to disagree. We had amazing debates in writing the big book of dashboards. Uh, and Jeff and I, when we first started Chart Chat, we wanted to resurrect those discussions. I do not see eye to eye to eye with my uh, Chart Chat chums here. And that is good. Over the years, all three of them have challenged me and critiqued and given feedback. And I am way better at what I do because of that. And we are hoping our discussions here will help open your eyes to new ideas. And I guess we're hoping to elevate the art a little bit through discussing this. Um, Andy did something that inspired me last chart chat. So I kind of make fun of slides like this, the dreaded agenda slide, you know, you see this and then we're gonna cover this and we're gonna cover this. Oh, it's a different color. I guess that's more important. Then we're gonna cover this thing. And he came up with this visual agenda or a visual table of contents. I went, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think he will confess he mostly did it so he knew who was going to be covering what topic, but I, I decided to emulate that and let me tell you what we have in store. So we're going to start with Jeff Schaefer. He's going to revisit the visualization, the visualization he did on the political divide in the United States because he's seen some other takes on this that he thought was chart chat worthy. Um, Amanda is then going to move to a uh, there was a Washington Post article, a collaboration with the Kaiser Family Institute about vaccine intentions among frontline healthcare workers. And this started as sort of an innocuous discussion of what do we think of this chart? And oh, it led to a fascinating rabbit hole. So uh, she'll be leading the charge with that. Then we'll be moving to our lightning round where we have some short segments. And I'm gonna be looking at two social media projects around data visualization, something from storytelling with data and Mark Bradburn's real world fake data. Just take a short time, but I wanna make sure you know about both of them because they are absolutely great. Um, speaking of absolutely great, um, as my computer seems to have giving me a hard time there, there we go. Um, a wonderful four part uh, blog post from Lisa Charlotte uh, Roast with Data Wrapper on effective and purposeful use of color in data visualization. And um, um, Amanda opened a bit of a can of worms with this particular discussion. Jeff is, uh, excuse me, Andy is gonna continue with that. Um, and we're gonna revisit 
the, the infamous or famous Menard's Napoleon March chart and uh, Robert Kosara produced a wonderful video about this and Andy has his take on it. We have our take on this and you are welcome in the chat to give us your take on it. But if you want to actually have your voice be heard, oop, I'm missing the slide, there we go. Stay for the after party. We will uh, make all of you panelists and you'll be able to participate so we're gonna talk and debate this for a bit. You can chime in on the chat and then you can become a panelist and join us as well. And with that, I'm gonna start stop sharing my screen and we're gonna to move to Jeff. Jeff, why don't you take us through? Great, so uh, this this is really just quick. Um, we This was in, in uh, our last chart that chat discussion. I was talking about different ways that you can visualize the, the presidential election. And, uh, you know, there, there's a great viz that I, I called out by um, Ken Flairledge, um, different different views of this. Uh, the the one that I did on this was was very granular at household level, and um, this is this is what I showed last time, uh, sort of at the end of, of chart chat, and kind of talked about it. And what I really liked about this view of of it is it gets down into the neighborhoods, the houses, the west side of Cincinnati versus the east side of Cincinnati, even down to streets that divide these these political parties. Um, and and this was a month ago I showed this this on on chart chat. What I wanted to um, show this time is a tweet that followed by the New York Times that was literally just two weeks after our chart chat episode. Uh, and they built this beautiful interactive, um, well, some, somewhat interactive, I guess, but they, they did um, 180 million uh, voters among 180 million voters, they took the top cities and basically did the exact same thing I did showing the neighborhoods, the household levels for the cities. And it is just a, a work of art. I love, I love everything about it. I, I love the way that they looked at the data, but I love the color, the use of, of, of the, the way that they did the small multiple maps. Um, they picked all these, these areas here, Chicago and Dallas, Fort Worth, um, New York, and, and then they really dive down into um, the details of this. So really cool, definitely something to check out. Um, I just found it fascinating. They even did Cincinnati um, and spread over into Kentucky across the river. I, I just did this, the city of Cincinnati and, and, and our county, Hamilton County, um, but they, they actually spread it out and went, went across the river. Um, but really interesting to see the different cities. Uh, you'll see the patterns of the downtown areas and the suburbs and uh, really a, a, just a great view of this. So um, I thought I just a shout out to the New York Times and the Upshot for um, some really great data viz here that I thought was really on point to what we were discussing. So we'll uh, post a link to that in the, uh, in the chat. And um, that's, that's all I have. Jeff, do you, do you think, um, sorry, can you keep, keep your screen share on? Do you, sure. do you think they were watching Chart Chat uh, last month? I, I, I inspired them perhaps, I like to think so. It, it would um, be great to think so. I don't. I don't think that they uh, in two weeks gathered all that data and put it up on their website. <laughs> um, so they probably had it in the works before, uh, before they yeah. saw our show. Maybe yeah. uh, one I thing I like. Do you want to toggle you... over to the upshot again? Um, yeah. I think you've got. Uh, I think you've got KFF up right now. Right. Yeah. Um, I find that the color palette's really interesting because you've got uh, blue red. Oh, hang on. We need to. Sharing the wrong screen. My. Fire. Yes, and and hold on, Jeff. Just that there's a little clarification here. Uh, were those voter registrations or were those how people voted? Because uh, um, um, my mine was registrations because I didn't have the vote at uh, the, the, the 2020 election. I mean, I don't, I don't think you can get the vote level data yeah. in the U.S. either. Right? I, I, th protected. I think you're right. I, I made a note on that on my viz specifically that it was registrations and, and it, it does. It says that right here. So, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry if I misspoke. But, yeah, you, ha you have to use registrations. I, right, so okay. I, I want to... Um, so Could you go down to the last be, set of four, yet? Because there was something really interesting with the color palette. Uh, I, it, whatever the last... Uh, was there another one after that? Yeah, damn that, that. Yeah. It's, like, it's really interesting how it's a red-blue palette, and yet there's this third color that emerges because of the granularity, the kind the of... Purple. The purple, yeah. Purple mix. I think that's... It, 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 it's, it's an outcome. It's not like built into the viz, but it is an outcome as a separate color, I think. So I find that really interesting. Yeah. And Jeff, well, when you get a chance, if you could post the link. 
I will do that. And right someone now. in the chat also commented back to us that there's complexity in that data in terms of how it gets collected by state because states have different requirements and different incentives for registering by parties. So if you're outside of the US context, some states have open versus closed primaries. And so if it's a closed primary, as in you have to be registered with a party to vote in it, you are more incentivized probably to register with a party. So I would guess there's a little bit of, uh, I'd be curious state, state by state, if you look at it, if there's a greater representation of who's in which party in some of those states with closed primaries or other incentives to actually register with a party. Anyways, any other comments on the upshot? Any other thoughts on the upshot before we go into the, the deep dive into a seemingly simple bar chart? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go deep. And to take us away. All right. Well. Or take it away. Leave us here. <laughs> I don't plan on, I, I'm hoping I'm not leaving you there. Otherwise, who's going to chime in with your other chart redesigns? <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about, at a, at a broad level, it's really about visualizing survey data. Um, what we're focusing on in this segment is talking about this joint study done by the Kaiser Family Foundation and the Washington Post. They did a frontline healthcare workers survey. It was published March 19th. The data was collected from early February to early March. And it was geared towards collecting information, not just about behaviors or other information in the pandemic or activities in the pandemic, but really diving into a lot of questions around vaccine acceptance or vaccine hesitancy. And out of that emerged two different reports. One was a, a published article from the Washington Post that led with this headline, more than four in 10 healthcare workers have not been vaccinated, a post-KFF poll finds. And you'll see in the chart below that this is the leading chart that they put after the initial kind of break in the, in the space in the text that has some key quotes. That focuses on the fact that we had 52% of health workers from their sample reported at least one dose being vaccinated. They did indicate that it was a nationally representative sample in terms of how they approached doing the data collection and all of the weighting behind the analysis. An additional 19% were scheduled, 12% haven't decided yet, and 18% of health workers who uh, didn't plan on being vaccinated at all. And the reason this even came on my radar in the first place, uh, a lot of stuff is going around around vaccine acceptance and vaccine hesitancy right now, is because John Schwabish actually posted a tweet asking about if the headline in this actual article is a fair representation of the data. So the question of when 30% of respondents say they either haven't decided or don't plan to get vaccinated, is it a fair description? And my response was, it's a fair description. I mean, it is a relatively accurate statement that doesn't overstate the certainty of what we know for sure. I think there are some questions though about what our incentives are to kind of overstate versus round up in this case, in terms of the share of healthcare workers who have not been vaccinated. That number, if you look back to this chart, is actually closer to 48%, not down around 40%, which is what four in 10 makes me think about. And I went and looked for the Kaiser Family Foundation reporting on the same thing, and they actually used a different title in their, their report and their kind of summary press release about the data itself. And they said that they found nearly half remain unvaccinated. So they had very different ways of displaying and reporting on this information just from a headlines perspective and how we report back on those kind of numbers. But looking through some of the data, the chart that caught my eye was this chart that actually broke down a lot of this data by various different categories or types of health workers. So you'll see on this panel that you have the overall total at the top and then for different groupings. So breaking out the healthcare workers by race, ethnicity, by where they work, by the type of work responsibilities and by education. You have the share of healthcare workers who personally received at least one dose. So off to the far left are scheduled or planning to receive, have not decided or don't plan to get vaccinated. And, and at, at a glance and looking at this more, I think this is a very straightforward way of representing all of this data and information. I think that they've done a nice job of making sure there's clear labeling and it's easy to read and compare the different bars to go ahead and identify small differences, especially in those smaller segments. Since these are all on one aligned scale, it looks like everything being out of 100% that they've given a clear indication of with the background shading on the bars with kind of the light gray shading that they've included. It's easy to kind of pluck out in some cases, some of the, the bigger or smaller segments when you read down a column and also be able to read across a row. So I really like panels like this because they enable me to do both of those things and on single aligned scales. So for example, if I'm reading scheduled or planning to receive the COVID-19 vaccine here, I'm starting from a zero point 
for all of those values instead of starting at 52% if we were to stack these or 39% or something else. But you could make an argument for other ways of visualizing this, which I'm sure my co-hosts are going to do shortly. <laughs> uh, but as I was looking at this, the, the question I asked as a public health professional, um, and those of you who joined us before, let me know that my background is in public health and health data visualization is around a couple of the smaller design decisions that get made as we're going ahead and creating charts and graphs like this. So one big question I had was, does it give me meaningful information if I'm a public health practitioner or someone who is kind of thinking about how do I use this data in a meaningful way? Does this give me the information I need and does it draw my attention to it? And I immediately was kind of curious about the choice of using a green color palette around the have not decided and do not plan to get vaccinated. I generally think those are green is associated with things that are good or that we like, or we are looking to have as outcomes. And so that was one point that jumped out to me as like a, a curious flip in terms of the palette and the palette selected. The second was around actually how these were broken out separately. And uh, we actually pulled the, the same data into a, just a quick data set that each of us had a chance to play with and use a bit. And I actually would really prefer to have those two categories for received one dose or planning two scheduled together. Because ultimately that group to me, if I'm a health communicator, thinking through the lens of a certain audience or a group, if I'm a health communicator, that's the group that I feel like I don't have to worry about as much. They already are planning to get vaccinated or they have been vaccinated. And so tracking and understanding what the progress is towards that herd immunity goal or something else, or tracking and seeing how that compares to a general population is really important and helpful. And then instead focusing on who are the people who are specifically these subgroups who I should be thinking about and looking into and better understanding what some of the barriers to vaccination are. Because one of the big challenges with planning to or scheduled is that while healthcare workers have been prioritized in a lot of states and places, access is still an issue and a concern, especially as you're drilling down, not just to say hospital-based health workers, but also people who are doing patient in-home care or working in doctor's offices. And so I actually find it more helpful to look at those two categories grouped together and then separating out and looking at my have not decided and do not plan to get vaccinated. Also, if I'm a public health communicator, I probably want to focus in a lot more on the group that I'm most likely to be able to convince and either convince in the long term or the short term to go ahead and get vaccinated. And so highlighting or focusing on this have not decided yet group and which of these different groups is actually the largest in terms of have not decided would be the space that I would really focus my attention on. Are these the people who we can convince or we can provide answers to questions that they have and very valid questions in many cases about the vaccines and their safety and efficacy. And if you actually drill down and look at the largest number in this undecided category, and we'll get into the margins of error not being reported directly on the chart itself. If you look at that 20% number, it's helpful to go and look at this overall chart in the context of the report and the other data that they presented and shared. Because immediately following this panel in the Kaiser study was actually looking at uh, where most vaccinated healthcare workers say they received the vaccine from their employer, but that share was the smallest in terms of those who are in the patient in home care category and where they work. So a smaller share was receiving the vaccine from their employer, which enables access in a meaningful way. And then the second piece of information that immediately follows that was around the fact that if you got your vaccine from your employer, it was actually easier, surprise, surprise, in terms of scheduling and administration and access, than if we actually had to go and seek out those appointments ourselves and say, I'm a healthcare worker who qualifies. And so I circle back on these other charts in part because I think it's important as we look at charts like this that have a really dense amount of information packed in one single panel or space to think about what I actually do with the information once I have it. And that's the public health lens that I think through this with and thinking about the biggest concern we have right now in a lot of spaces is around accessibility of getting the vaccine, not necessarily around hesitancy, though that's really important to look at as well in terms of these vaccine intentions. And so as we think about and look at this data in context, I think thinking about it in the context of the other things this study looked at is really important. Over to team, thoughts, feelings, concerns. I really like your. Uh, I, 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 can you go to? I, I think this is great, Amanda. I, I think the grouping is really uh, important on the first one. And then on the second one, I'm going to ask you a question which I anticipate is going to be asked of mine. So, on the, if you go, why did you choose only to label one category here? 
I would choose to label only that category if it was the one I wanted someone to read and focus on the most. So in terms of highlighting it with color and also highlighting it with and putting the numbers on it, I think that it ends up getting a little bit cluttered to have all of the labels across all of the different bars in terms of readability. Suddenly, and this happens to me even on this chart, I get stuck as I try to kind of read the numbers and especially on the short segments where the numbers are hanging off the bars in some spots and inside the bars and others. And so if I was trying to work with a team and talk about this in a team setting about how are we sending a new communication strategy about who we're going to reach, if our focus is on trying to figure out who has the biggest segments of have not decided, and we also want to look at kind of how big are each of these populations or groups as well, um, I would mm. want to go ahead and focus people's attention that way. So I think it's a deliberate choice around kind of how sometimes you use these things in layers or in a presentation where you might actually highlight one group and label it. And then on the next slide, highlight and label a different group so that it looks almost animated as you click through yeah. it. And you're able to yeah. talk about and focus on individual series at a time. I, yeah, you, you'll see a similar uh, choice on my path to my final result. So <laughs> thank you for answering the question that I anticipated I was going to get. I have a shallow question I want to ask, which is what font are you using? I really <laughs> that, like it. <laughs> that was oh, literally the other question yeah. I asked. <laughs> uh, Benchcraft, Bench, I think. It's, what is it? It's it? tight. I like the narrowness of it. Yeah. What's it called? Benchcraft? I'll double check it in my workbook. Okay. It's available Thank you. on Tableau. It's in the Tableau workbook. Is it? Yeah. Wow. This whole font family is in the Tableau workbook. I taught something to a Tableau employee about their own product. I feel so good. That, that, that's increasingly easier these days. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really easy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that font too. Well, um, uh, shall I? Yeah, so I think um, my, my goal, and I wanted to open with some of these kind of contextual points and to share the original chart, but I'm going to hand it over to Steve and then we'll kind of keep tossing the mic over to Andy and Jeff. Uh, like I said, we actually pulled this data off of this chart and each of us took a chance to play with it and think about oh, how we- Sorry, I just, thought, I just killed- So I'm gonna uh, let J uh, Steve go ahead and take it away with the deep dive and rabbit hole he went down on methodology documentation. I uh, don't know how, how deep uh, it was, but let me share my- um, And you can see this sort of prominent uh, data not vetted yet uh, in case someone- takes a screenshot of this and shares it with somebody. I don't want this getting out in the wild because I'm not convinced this is as all the facts behind it. In any case, the first thing was, I kind of liked the chart as it was presented in that report and thought there were some valuable things in it, but I kind of went down the same um, path that you did as well, which is, you know, um, hey, shouldn't, you know, the, I got the shot and I'm scheduled to get the shot probably makes more sense to combine those things together, especially something from February 11th when somebody was scheduled to get it, they may have it by the time this thing is produced. So um, also I chose these colors because I kind of wanted to see Andy's head explode again. Um, so dark blue means I've been, you know, been vaccinated, light blue means it's just a matter of time before the vaccination, gray is I haven't decided yet, and orange is I'm not gonna do this. Um, so my go-to with this thing, first attempt is I'll try a divergent stack bar chart. And I think it makes sense to have the dark blues um, against the baseline here. So I can compare how many people have gotten it. And then the light blue is just a matter of time before you hit a certain threshold. Um, comparing the grays with each other, does it make sense to have these along the baseline so I can see, ooh, 20% over here or is it the people who don't plan? Does it make sense to have th those along the baseline, et cetera? And went with this approach instead, which is I've become a, put the neutrals off to the side because these are the people whose opinions you may be able to sway and say, maybe we can get them. Um, and then the, the blues to me, they go together because it's just a matter of time before that happens. And I wanted to know, well, gee, when do we reach herd immunity? There are so many discussions and debates about this. I don't know what the answer is and there should probably be a rough band, but let's say it's at you know, 70%. So I can see, hey, well, overall total frontline healthcare workers, we're gonna hit this magical 70% or maybe you change it to 75%. 
well, where are the things way above that? Where are they way below? Where are the places that maybe we need to put more emphasis uh, on this? And, you know, the other things that, that really pop out are, wow, you know, less than a college degree, big group of people refusing to get it. And, and, and you're certainly seeing the two big incendiary headlines that I see all the time is that uh, black people seem reluctant to take the vaccine and white Republicans. And that made me want to know a little more about the data. And that's where I got kind of concerned. And, and great job, Kaiser Family um, um, Foundation uh, saying, oh, here's, here's the information. And in particular, all right, the overall thing that we reported on, we're seeing plus or minus three percentage points. But when we get into uh, race and ethnicity, we're seeing plus and minus nine percentage points. Um, uh, when we're getting into where they work, when they're getting into um, uh, the granularity of these things, the, the uh, margin of error is pretty significant. So what does that mean? So, well, here is just the overall survey. P personally received it, scheduled to get it, have not yet decided, do not plan to get it. And if we put the margin of error on this in there, you know, we can see, all right, it's still within these contexts, but let's now dig in on, you know, the stuff that's getting a lot of headlines. Um, oop, let me turn that off so we can have the the big dr dramatic effect of the animation playing out. And I don't think I'm sharing optimized for animation. So, um, but the, um, you know, the, the black healthcare workers who don't plan to get the vaccine, 28%. Um, well, what happens when we turn on this margin of error and you can see, oh my God, it's a huge um, delta between, you know, it could be, you know, I don't know if this is 95% of the time you can expect something to be within this range, 5% of the time it may be out of it. But if, if we're looking at the margin of error, it's as low as 19% or as high as 37%. Same thing when we look at where people work um, and if we're focusing on the people who don't plan to get it, et cetera. So I don't think this very large margin of error um, uh, in these things that are getting headlines is properly being conveyed. And that's my biggest concern around this whole thing. And uh, that's kind of my take uh, on this. I'll stop sharing my screen and we can discuss or move my colleagues. Well, that, that's, I mean, the, the, to include or not include uncertainty and margin of error is, it's, a, it's always a hot topic, isn't it? Because without it, you have a nice clear essentially what the KFS original is essentially a table of numbers, right? It's nice. It's clear, um, but the clarity comes at the expense of uh, uncertainty. And yes. I think <laughs> one, of the I one of the complicating factors for me, Steve, is really around the unquantifiable error, right? So there are those margins of error that we can actually plot and we can look at and quantify. And then there's kind of key events that happened during the survey period. For example, Johnson & Johnson's vaccine was released and approved for U.S. FDA authorized use uh, February 27th. And that is right smack in the middle of the survey period. And so did having another vaccine be released, did that have any sway on people in terms of their predilections to choose to get vaccinated or not? And also it may have also accelerated the availability of vaccines in terms of shifting people into different groups. And so I think there's just so much complexity in running these kind of surveys and studies in the midst of a very kind of emergent situation <laughs> where the terms and the environment are constantly changing on you, even in a four week survey period, that makes some I of that reporting the, around error so hard. The, the, you know, the top, you know, I started looking at what was the methodology and how did they gather this and who did they call it, et cetera. I didn't even touch that. I just looked at, hey, we here we are letting you know what our known margin of errors, you know, margin of survey error is on this. And it's pretty wide in some of these categories. And, and I find that, um, I don't. I don't think that was conveyed in the Washington Post article. Or Can you put up your margin of error uh, view again? I had one question for you about that in terms of some of the choices, which I really, I really like the way that you display the kind of band behind the dot. I think it's a really effective way to point out what that band looks like. Mm -hmm. And well, kind of Jeff kind of hit me to is. this years ago. Um, <laughs> but it looks it, so. It looks really fixed, right? So that it's like equally likely to be distributed at any point in that period. 
Are there instances in which you would choose to add any kind of gradient or something else that would lighten that as it moves out to the outer edges, if that's a less likely place for, some, for the number to land? Um, oh, hold on one sec. Um, part of it is the ease of, of doing this. Um, um, hold on, I think I can dig something up pretty quickly for you. Um, uh, while you're doing that, yeah. uh, Daniel asked, and he said this was a shallow question, but I think uh, Steve framed it as shallow, but it's not shallow. He asked, uh, are serif fonts ever better than sans serif fonts? Uh, and now I've lost the question, so I can't see. Um, is there ever a case where serif fonts are better than sans serif? Uh, Jeff or Amanda, do you have perspectives on that from a data viz perspective? I, I would say nothing's better than anything else. I, I, it, it really depends. That's your favorite, your uh, catchphrase, Andy. I think you got it, I think you got it trademarked, but uh, I think it depends on the application, right? So there, there, there is research that uh, sans serifs are uh, more readable. You'll see a lot of things in, in print and, and, and in certain instances, um, you know, the serifs uh, do sometimes um, get in the way of read readability. So that, that's why a lot of things are moving in that direction, but um, there's such a variety of, of fonts. I, I, more important topic for me is just accessibility of the fonts. And I don't mean um, a, as a disability or anything. I, I mean, just the function of the, the software systems, you know, uh, the great font that Amanda chose. And it is, it does show up maybe in, in Tableau desktop, but you put something on Tableau server or Tableau public, and um, you only have so many fonts that are whatever's loaded on that server or whatever's available in public. So for me, I, I generally look at that. What is, what is the, way that I'm disseminating the information then becomes important so that the fonts will render properly or as expected uh, for the user. And I, I think that's probably the most important font question. Yeah, I would great. say that the, the enjoy, enjoyment of fancy fonts seems to have driven people to do a lot of um, text blocks as images on Tableau public visualizations, having been an Iron Biz judge last year. And as lovely as they look, Remember that if you don't alt text tag that image with the, with the font and with, or with the text itself, which oftentimes is used for legends and other really important information, it is wholly inaccessible to someone with a screen reader. So just mm -hmm. be mindful of that. If you're someone who's playing around with kind of fancy fonts and embedding images for your text, just to make sure you don't have that rendering issue. Steve, you found a page that has all the answers. I found the page and just, just the whole you know rabbit hole that I went down with this stuff. Um, and, and in fact, Jeff pointed me to some articles that eventually led to, you know, what I decided upon with this. Um, but, you know, first looked at some stuff that Ben Jones had done and went, you know, and anyone who watches Star Wars goes, well, those look yeah. like toy fighters. <laughs> um, you know, maybe try something like this. Then I came up with, you know, the fingernail chart, you know, which was trying to show that. Oh, I and can't then, unsee that now, Steve. I never would have thought of a fingernail. And now I can't yeah. unsee that. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's a very Mona Chalabi, isn't it? <laughs> that type of thing. And then a lot of people like this thing, but it's, it's a really, you know, this is like, oh, I'm going to have to get the flare widgets or somebody else and can get me involved and figure out how to do this. And then things like that. And eventually... Uh, ended up with this. Um, just getting to the the font discussion, realized a whole bunch of decisions and things we do were made like in the early 80s by Steve Jobs. You know, the first laser writer came with two fonts, came with Helvetica and it came with Times Roman. And, it, and we all learned, put the headings in Helvetica and your body text in Times Roman. And for years, screens, the resolution on screens were terrible. And trying to look at a serif font on screen was deplorable. And you just kind of learn, oh, if it's going to be on screen, I'm going to use a sans serif. And now there's a whole debate, do the serifs help people read when there's a lot of body text, et cetera. But a lot of those decisions and guidances came from stuff that's no longer uh, applicable uh, at all. In, in any case, the whole point that you had, Amanda, about that maybe you know, it shouldn't be as thick, as dark, or whatever, I just quickly wanted to show this, these error bars are enormous. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Cool. And a story for another time. We almost wrote the book, uh, the big book of Helvetica, but we'll, we'll save that story for another <laughs> I would call out before we kind of pivot over to Andy's question. I thought Sarah's point was really, really mindful around the idea of labeling groups as being hesitant in terms of this balance between hesitancy versus accessibility of a vaccine or a vaccine site. 
We know about a lot of the digital divide accessibility issues. There's also how far do you have to travel that she pointed out with a great link to an NPR analysis. This is one of the things, the beefs I took with some of the side-by-side -side maps that we're actually looking at where is, uh, where are people being vaccinated versus where is COVID? And some of those actual kind of distinctions were driven by prioritization decisions. So if you're only, if you're prioritizing, for example, 65 plus, plus a couple smaller other groups of essential workers like healthcare workers, you're going to naturally see that actually just older wards in DC, for example, saw that they had higher vaccination rates faster. And those are not the same locations where you saw a heavier burden of COVID. And so, yeah, I think it's important to think about the ways in which those policy decisions and those um, eligibility decisions also shape what this data looks like. And that's why healthcare workers, I think, is really interesting because they were included across the board in the national recommendations for who should be in the first phase of uh, vaccine eligibility here in the U.S. Andy? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, I see Tim Beard says he was once, in once introduced to the guy that designed Arial Font. Um, that's a pretty good claim to fame. I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, all right. Okay. So my intent uh, was just at the start was to try and stay as close as, as the original. Um, a simple display without um, interactivity. So on the, on the right, you're going to see all the decisions I made along the way. First of all, remake it in Tableau. It's always a good exercise. Remake it in whatever tool you use. Secondly, um, then I, I, this title, I, I'm, I'm, I was picking some nitty gritty things. I hated this title case. So straight away, I re removed the title case to make it way more readable since we've talked about that. Uh, next up, I then started making an editorial decision. The category that I was most fixated on was those who don't plan on getting vaccinated because I think um, while Amanda's framed, correctly framed these as a great target because maybe we can at least change their mind, it is fascinating that the data at face value, possibly not accurately, has uh, some alarming categories. So I chose to make that one uh, blue, and that was my editorial decision to focus on that. Uh, after that, I sorted. I thought instead of alphabetical, I think it's nicer to see these in descending order within each categories. Uh, so we can see the uh, black healthcare workers at the top of their category, assuming the data is correct. Um, I also did the labeling choice here, Amanda, I think it's quite a controversial choice, but it, because it really depends on how you then present this chart. If somebody wanted to read this chart in a magazine, then you, you would keep the label to. Uh, after that, again, now I've focused on this, I want this one to be over on the left. So it has more primacy of position. And at this point, I went down some rabbit holes. I did try a basic stacked bar chart, really didn't like it. Uh, but most of Many reasons not to like it. It's a horizontal layout with a vertical legend. So that's just in this instance, really poor. Um, so I didn't like the stack bar. So, oh yeah. So, and then, uh, and then I'm like, well, actually I'm fixating on the blue bar. So why not just show that data? So that's what I did. I thought I'm getting rid of everything else. I'm making the editorial decision. I want to focus on the people who don't intend to get vaccinated. At which point we have the formatting existential crisis should the label be on the inside or the outside the inside or the outside i stuck with the inside in the end should it be bigger or smaller i made it a little bit bigger but then i was like oh, oh and then the last i've just made a sort of border and shading change there but then i'm like well this bar's really long uh, i guess like i've been I've, i feel like as i'm getting older i'm getting more fixated on aspect ratios uh, so i think i narrowed it down a little bit and then I realized my decision was no good because 28%, the bar looks good, but it's actually 28% of 100, isn't it? So where's the other 72%? So then I made what might be the most controversial choice. I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this as individual pies. Look at Steve's, Steve's head is dropping in dismay, right? Yeah, this is and when Steve walked out of chart chat. No. <laughs> this, I just want to, you know, I mean, why not generate some controversy? The more I, the more I've looked at it, I kind of like it. Uh, I've still got oh, one. Come on, Andy, just do the <laughs> filled bar to 100% and do it as a thermometer. It's an uh, instant what read. It's missing, what it's missing is the label. So the final thing I did was actually add the label. So I made an editorial choice to focus on the category who didn't get intend to get vaccinated. The table is there. A pie chart there is to show you the percent of whole. And I chose a pie because you know what? Sometimes one slice is okay. 
Uh, and this is uh, and this is how a world of chart chat participants were able to go argue to their leadership that suddenly or uh, someone's leader was able to argue back to them that side by side pie charts are of course acceptable. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying they're always acceptable, but uh, anyway, there you go. I thought I'd generate some uh, conversation with. This. See, I thought mine was going to be controversial. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the 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 and wait wait I've got to make the case. Why not just have um a reference line at 100% that you fill, mm -hmm. and then you see how far along, oh, I can see this is more than a quarter of the way, and you can see where 100% is, because your point is well taken. A big long bar that's 28% looks like that looks great, but actually it's only mm -hmm. you know this far along, and why not do it that way and make an easy comparison, Andy, as opposed to trying to compare pie yeah. charts? Uh I think there's two reasons why, well, there's three reasons. First of all, by the time I'd gone down the pie path, I'd kind of run out of the time I had available to continue the other options. Uh, secondly, I, I mean, if you imagine this stack bar as something essentially similar to that, then you actually have quite a lot of non-data space with all the grays uh, because 28% actually doesn't stretch that very far over. So I think there was a dead space. I had also, by the time I'd gotten here, gotten quite uh, attached, oops, gotten quite attached to the narrow aspect ratio. So I was like, how can I keep it? Show, show the original chart, Andy, and then I've yeah. got to see what Jeff is doing. Just show the yeah. very first one that that um, um, Kaiser Family Foundation did. Uh, yeah, they, you know, I've, I've, no, but we need I mean, to see it in all its glory because they did something. They didn't just have bars in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. by the way, by the way. Behind the bars were really nice. Uh, yes, the showing where the hundred percent was in each one, um, not that one. Oh, that's there. Oh, that's mine, isn't it? Sorry. Yes. There we go. Okay, and now mm -hmm. just um, you know, if you were to just focus on the third column, and I can easily see where twenty-eight percent is and how far away it is. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm not saying don't do the pies. I'm not saying this is great. I just want everyone who's watching right now to say, forget the first three columns, just look at that one and imagine presenting it this way. Yep. I'm yep. shutting yep. up now. That would be valid. Uh, and my, in, my uh, intent has been achieved. I so Andy, why did you pick blue? Why did I pick blue? Because um, blue is a good alert color and... Uh, is blue, is blue a good alert color? <laughs> it's, well, it's a good alert. Blue against gray is a good alert color, isn't it? I, uh, I, uh, I would yes. describe it as, as reasonable contrast. I know I'd call it an alerting color. I don't see blue and get, get concerned. Uh, well, you know, because it, it's one of those things that I could choose red. I, it's one of those things you see a lot of people go, well, if you, if you choose something like red as an alert color, then you're over-egging, you're overselling the alert nature. So I'm just really using blue here to call out the category I want people to focus on, not not necessarily say, you know, sirens blare, sir, sirens blaring. Um, I like your big readable numbers. I want to give you a shout out for the big re readable numbers and not tiny labels on your pies. I mean, the big readable numbers are nice and they're sorted in a way that makes sense. There mm -hmm. was a question from one of the audience members who asked about our logic on what order we listed the demographic breakouts in. Um, I left mine in the same order that KFF had used, I believe, I think. Um, but there was not a deliberate reorganization done. Otherwise, it was alphabetical. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to make one final defense of pies. Now, I'm only defending pies here because I knew we were going to make four remakes, and I thought, why not uh, stir up the pot a little bit by sorting the pie charts? While we cannot tell the different what the actual values are, we can compare the up. We can see the difference in sizes very easily. Steve, I agree. If this was just a bar like in the original chart, then it would still be just as effective. That that would still be an effective thing. But this was the path I went down. Steve, I just see a face of absolute shock and horror and disappointment. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just thinking of how would we show uncertainty with these? Oh well, we can have 3D. And uh, <laughs> well, it was not my intent to show uncertainty. I, was I understand. Face -face. I'm, I'm right. dying to see I'm what you're seeing. A lot of defense in the, yeah. there's, there's so a lot of defense in the we're... chat. Bars, bars, bars can be boring. Something yeah, said. Uh, yeah, I'm no. seeing that. I'm seeing that. Yep. Uh, Let's see. So thank you. We're, thank we're you done. for my fans. I want to leave time for the other things. Let's see what yep. Jeff's got. Yeah, go, got Jeff. Jeff. All right. Um, 
you know, I've worked with Steve for a long time, so probably no, uh, n- nothing unusual that I, I ended up doing something like that he did. And I was looking at diverging uh, stacks. I, I figured as I, I moved through some of these things, I, I, I sort of landed on these stacked bars and then was really asking the question of what, at the end of the day, what this is really showing. Um, and this is what I thought would be controversial is that I have students who just turned in an assignment in the last two weeks and got a comment back on their assignment that said, you know, these stacked bars are not really ideal for making comparisons. You should probably unstack them. And here I go taking something that's unstacked and I, I end up stacking them to, to do this. The reason I think it's more important to stack these is because you're trying to reach a certain number. You're trying to reach this, this herd immunity. And so this was really the basis of, of where I ended up. Now, I tried all sorts of different things and tried it in various methods. And what I ended up coming back to at the end of the day was just a good old stack bar chart. So I, you know, as much as I liked, you know, some of these other variations, you know, I, I, the colors and the dots and things, dealing with 1300 people, I, I even tried to go down the path of putting 1300 dots, you know, down and, and, and that wasn't going to work. And I realized that that pretty quickly. So, um, so here's where I ended up. I ended up really with a simple chart like this. And that was the basis for my remake. The idea of what I was trying to show is I'm trying to get to this line in some form or fashion. What percentage of the people that do not plan to get vaccinated or are not sure, like what segment of those have to cross that line to get me to the the goal? And so here's where I ended up. Let's see if you think you like this or you don't but we're trying to squeeze in a few more vaccines. We're trying to push the 18 or some portion of that 12 into the tube to get past that mark of herd immunity. And the line that I use, there's some questions as to what herd immunity really is. Maybe it's 80%. That's the number I chose to use. I put a range in there to kind of show that, you know, that's not really a fixed goal that everybody agrees on. Some say 75, some may say 90, um, but that this is really what, what you're starting on. And then what I did is, is tried to show that by all the components, um, you know, ultimately in a viz that, that shows where each of those groups are reaching that line and where they're not reaching that line. I tried to call out areas like nursing homes and patient care and um, the, uh, um, the, the, the black population assisting with patients, less than college degrees. I put a little orange dot there to say, hey, we're not, we're not gonna meet it. We're even, even if you got all the unsures, you're still not gonna get to your target line. And then the last piece I struggled with was the margin of error. I knew that that was important, especially in some of these smaller groups. Um, I did reorder the data because I thought that where you work is probably the most important thing. And I put that at the top because proximity of people seems to probably be the more important thing to herd immunity than your education or your race. Um, So I put that at the top, but it's important to look at those margin of errors. And I tried to put that off to the side. Um, I did do a version without that just to make it simple. But in the end, I thought the margin of error is just an extra little bit of information that people might want to know. And and there is a big difference. If you look at the whole group, you know, we're pretty confident in these numbers and there's a very low margin of error. But if you start breaking this out to nursing homes, it's a very wide margin of error. So that's where I ended up. I really Ooh. like your, your category labels on the right. So you can read them. I can read my, the margin of error and I can read the bar easily on what they are. I think that's very nice. Well, and Jeff, I think spot on with the reference line showing this is what we're trying to achieve. And that and and that's what I was thinking as well and made it parameterized. I hope it's only 70 percent. Maybe it's uh, uh, it's larger than that. So I think that is spot on to see, well, where where are we going to make this up um, uh, so that we get there? So I think that's that's terrific. And oh, somebody I'm, had a great comment in the uh, comment about the, the top needle being longer than the other bars. I fought with that one because I had all these labels that I had to fit in there and I was going back and forth on that. And, and I did a bunch of variations on that one. So yeah, that one bothered me. I, I really tried to fight how to fit. By that the way, the, the three of you really went down stuff because I, I just got the, hey, let me get the idea across. You, oh, the three of you made something which is actually polished and ready for publication, which is the, you know, I did the, the stuff that's easy to do in 20 minutes, 
versus the additional three hours to get stuff that looks great. So I'm um, major props to you on this uh, yeah, for creating uh, I, something yeah. which is uh, yeah, gorgeous. I've got a comment on Jeff's, I think a general comment on, um, I don't think I've ever written about this, but how charts have a primary and a secondary uh, questions they can answer. And what I really like about what you've done, Jeff, is you've got, well, the primary question here is, are we over 80%? That's the primary thing the chart does, right? And this has always been the argument that I've had in support of stack bar charts is that they they have a primary thing they can answer. And then the secondary thing is how big are all the bars that are in the middle of the stack? You can't answer that accurately. But since the intent of this was to say, how close is, are we to 80%? That's okay, because your intent was to answer one primary question and the stacks add secondary level of information. Um, I've always found that a really helpful way to think of charts when I try and critique uh, a chart designer's intent. Yeah. I think there's just a lot of good stuff here, Jeff, the alerting icon and the ones that aren't reaching mm -hmm. the threshold, those kind of things. I think that the threshold is tricky to me because it is such a range. And so making it absolute is tough. And the question I would ask then is, what do we expect from a healthcare worker? So if I expect healthcare workers should be more vaccine um, acceptant or more vaccine interested than a general, the general population, if I expect that, should this be even more concerning to me versus what the general population looks like? And with the, the also the, the challenge that we have with looking at herd immunity is around the denominator and calculations for who's eligible for vaccination. You'll see some people talking now about the fact that without kids being eligible, you're, also, you're already cutting out basically the chunk of people who would get you from 75 to 100. It's about 25% of the population that would be currently ineligible. If I remember what I read correctly. And so I think that thinking about kind of the, the messiness of herd immunity is, is the tricky thing too, that would be good to have in context. Jeff, I also really like the little reddish dot pointing out, well, here are the places where we're not, we're not reaching it, you know, the, the drawing attention to it. Thank you. Well, right, shall well, we, shall we, we've got, it. um, I don't want to derail anybody. You've got comments or other stuff that you want to show. Otherwise, I want to move I, to. No, I just I noticed uh, Kenneth asked if we if people can do an Iron Viz style vote. I suggest <laughs> we uh, do that in the after party. We yeah. Are, yeah. So this oh, stick well, around. I'm, I'm withdrawing mine. Mine is not uh, publication worthy. Oh, no, I, I'm going to so. vote for Jeff's. Let's be clear. I'm voting for Jeff's. I think Jeff's was has all the information all in one place. <laughs> well, let's see what the audience say in the after party. Yep. Yeah, so. All right, so hold on lightning one second. Uh, lightning round, let me just share my screen. There are two incredibly <clears throat> useful public social media data visualization projects um, that are constantly crossing my path. There are more than two. There's Workout Wednesday, there's Makeover Monday, but some of the stuff I'm seeing that storytelling with data is uh, this I'm going, yeah, you see this all the time. Oh, that comes up all the time. And it's, hey, here are these business scenarios and situations that you're probably going to run into at some point in your data visualization practice. How would you do this? How would you deal with this data and showing it, you know, before an initiative and after an initiative? You can participate. You can try it yourself and you can see what other people have done. So check out what's happening at Storytelling with Data. And then some amazing stuff coming from Mark Bradburn and real world fake data. And I'm, I'm seeing some dashboards I'm salivating over and would be, you know, if there's ever a second edition of the big book of dashboards, we would definitely include these things. So um, I encourage everyone here to check those things out. And that's what I've got for my lightning round. Jeff, I think and it's over to you for color, doing, right? Am I doing the color? Yep. Yep. Quick share. Lisa Charlotte Ross uh, posted, uh, if you're not following her, you, you have to follow her. Everything she writes up in, in the data visualization, uh, you know, whether it's about charts or, or whatever, it, it, it's always a great read. Um, you could see by the reactions, the likes and the retweets of this, this post that she did, um, you know, a relatively simple topic of, you know, what you would think would be simple, right? How to use color in, in data visualization, which color scale. Um, we talk a lot about this in, in the book. And so, right, you know, right off the bat, sequential diverging categorical and she's got these this four-part series um it it is super in-depth well worth your time to read not going to go into that here but just wanted to call it out um 
really great work. And if you have not seen this or not following her, um, this is this is some great stuff. So check it out. Yeah, great. Uh, I second what Jeff has said. All right, uh, my lightning round is uh, if you've not seen the Menard chart, then go, uh, well, go and watch this video. If you have seen the Menard chart, then go and watch this video. Uh, many people say this is the best chart ever. For many, it's the favorite. In fact, today, for I've gone triple whammy. So you can see it on my, if you're looking at my camera, you can see it on my picture. I've got my Menard mug. That's, whoops, I've just thrown tea everywhere. And I'm even wearing a Menard t-shirt. I have, in tribute, I've gone full Menard. Right, because this is an amazing chart. Uh, but the story that we normally tell about Menard is highly abbreviated. Uh, this story about Napoleon's, uh, folly in 1812 has much more depth to it than we often talk about in, uh, in the data visualization field. And Robert Cassara has done this great video uh, last week talking about the extra context that actually exists behind a much simplified view. It's a really good video. Uh, I don't agree with 100% of it, but that's I don't think I ever agree with 100% of Robert's content, uh, but it is really, really good. I highly recommend you go and watch it you'll learn more about um, Menard's chart and Napoleon's folly uh, just by going to that. And that's Eager Eyes. You can see the video on YouTube or eagereyes.org. It's uh, really, really well done. I've watched it yeah. twice now. And mm -hmm. um, he, it's just uh, does a great job putting it together. Yeah. Super production. And you can get into the fray of debating the importance of that chart and should it be held up as the Mona Lisa of all charts or what was the term that, oh, I meant to get this. The, the, it's worth it to just, there's a term for something that is a word or, or phrase that is only used once an entire corpus. Uh, oh shoot, I meant to look that up. And it's like worth it just to know what that word is. And he's saying, this is a one-off chart. One thing, one time, you should never see it used for anything else ever. Um, um, a singleton, one-off, et cetera. And it was an interesting, um, uh, oh yeah, I never thought that this thing that's held up is maybe not something you should be making in your own organization. Anyone happen to remember the term? Think of some of the Du Bois challenge comments and discussions that I've seen around um, hand-drawn visualizations and kind of emerging from the world of hand-drawn visualizations over into things created and driven by computers. And if one of the powerful pieces of some of these older charts is just kind of the level of detail done with all of the hand illustrations. Uh, Hapex uh, Legomena, or, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, or, or Hapex legomen, uh, Legomenon. Um, sorry about that, just had to look up that word. Andy, we can't hear you. Sorry, the annotations clearly add a huge amount to this chart. And I think where I disagree with Robert is I think he, he sometimes veers to criticizing the fact that we're looking at a highly aggregated story. And I'm like, well, that's kind of the point. And it doesn't stop it being many people's gateway to data visualization. I first saw this chart back in 1996 when I was a software engineer, and that was the start. Um, you know, and, and uh, learning the extra context over 25 years, bloody me heck, 25 years, you know, that's great. It doesn't matter that it summarized the information at the, at the start and I was missing a huge amount of context. So I'm about to show the closing slides as well as announce what's going on uh, the next time around, uh, unless my chart chat chums want to weigh in and then we're going to make everybody who wants to stay a panelist and we you can tell us where we're Full of delight or full of something else? I am looking forward to people's responses. So workshops, recordings, and resources for Chart Chat and associated with the Big Book of Dashboards can be found at bigbookofdashboards.com. Also, uh, the requisite plug for those of you in Asia Pacific time zones. I am offering one time this year uh, my Building World-Class Business Dashboards Workshop, April 20th and 22nd for people who live there. For me, it's April 19th and 21st. So you can go to bigpick.me at PAC 2021. And we have a special guest joining us for the next Chart Chat Live. This will be on April 22nd. There is the URL that will uh, where you can register. But we have um, and the, you know, one of the heroes of data debunking, uh, the host 
of one of Andy's favorite BBC programs. Um, what's the name of that, Andy? More or Less. More or Less. And the author of one of my favorite books of the last year, we have special guest Tim Harford that's going to be with us, who wrote, uh, he's written a number of books, given a whole bunch of TED Talks, but the name of the book in the UK and Europe is called How to Make the World Add Up. Uh, the most the book in the U.S. is called The Data Detective. So I hope you will be able to join us on April 22nd. I'm excited, and I'm sure my uh, fellow chart chat chums are excited <laughs> as well. Uh, right. Sarah, Sarah asks, can we ask him to bring a shanty song, which is a fantastic joke, Sarah, only one that will be understood by listeners of more or less. So thank you for making me smile. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to... Um, begin the process with my co-hosts of clicking all the attendees. Anyone that um, wishes to stay, let me stop sharing the screen. Um, and we will start making you all panelists, anyone who would like to stay. And Andy will be leading the charge um, Yeah, uh, with that. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you for leaving. See you all next time.